can't get rid of me. Friends, I am back. Thank you for your patience. I know that one week turned into like three weeks pretty quickly. Um, depression will do that to a bitch. It really will. I'm gonna hop right in and get to it. So I took a break and I realized how badly I needed it. And then I got violently sick. <laughs> like I I don't know if it was allergies or food poisoning or what, but like I was fighting for my life. I didn't go to the gym for a week. It's now been over a week, honestly. Um, it just like, it just kind of kept hitting where I was like, I'm still so tired being like, what is the harm in giving myself some extra time? You know, it's okay for me to just rest and I'll get back when I get back. And guess what? I'm back. You're welcome. Hello. So some updates. Number one, dating. Um, there is no roster. There is one person and I think we're dating. Um, let's talk about it. So I should probably go back and re-listen to the last episode. So the doctor is gone. He was kind, but like also really awkward and like a little, little interesting, you know, he, he was very sweet. It's, I think he couldn't get over the like age gap. And it just, like, it didn't feel romantic, you know? Like, it was just, like, okay, like, I'm just getting to know this person. And, like, I think people forget that, like, first dates, you don't have to be, like, oh, my God, this is the person. Like, we went on two coffee dates. We were supposed to get dinner. And I canceled the dinner date because Monsieur Tromix, uh, Mr. Tromix, man, I don't know if I talked about him, um, but that week that I went on all my crazy dates, he was my Friday night. We got drinks at a bar. I think I talked about it. He looked different than I was imagining he was going to look. And in like the most pleasant way, he was actually really cute. And um, he Ubered me home, which I was like, wow. Okay. And before he Ubered me home was like, I want to see you tomorrow. Like, I want to take you to dinner tomorrow. It's like, okay. Like I kind of have some plans tomorrow during the day. And he was like, I, like, that's fine. Like I'll take you to dinner. And it's like, okay. Then we went, we got dinner and dinner was great. And then before he left that day, he was like, I want to see you again. When can I see you? Like, what does your schedule look like? And I was like, I, I work late. I mean, like I'm recording right now and it's 1130 PM. I was going to go to the gym tonight, but I, I just didn't feel it. And I was like, you know what? I can go home and I can record and I feel motivated to record. So I'm going to do what I feel motivated to do. Right. Going to lean into that. Cause we're not, we're not forcing ourselves back into things, right? We're, we're tiptoeing back in and we're going easy on ourselves so that we don't frazzle and burn. Right. And so he brought me dinner, I think was the third date. Like brought me dinner when I had gotten off of work and like came over and stayed late and just talked with me and smooched a lot and it was really pleasant. And I don't know, it's 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 fun and it's cool and I really like him. And it's been about almost a month since our first date. And I think we're dating. So here's here's the most awkward thing. Like do people say like, will you be my girlfriend? Or is that like seventh grade? Right. Cause like I'm in my mid twenties, <laughs> he's in his mid twenties and it feels awkward to be like, do you want to be boyfriend and girlfriend? Like, how do you ask that? Right. Like you don't, no one's asking. I don't remember the last time that someone asked me to be their girlfriend. Like, it just was like, so are we dating now? Like, is this a relationship? And it was like, yeah, this is a relationship or like, I listened to a podcast that was talking about like, how do you bring it up? And it's like, one of the best ways is like, if you're going into a place like, Hey, how do I introduce you to these people? How do you want me to like, like, you're my friend, you're my boyfriend, you're the guy I'm kissing until 2am. Like, how do you want me to introduce you? And so I think that's a really good way to be like, Hey, I know that we said that we're not seeing other people. I know that you've stated your intentions. I know that you've like, and that's something I really respect and really like about this guy is he was like, I want you like, I want you to cut the roster. I want you to like, give me 
a chance. And, you know, I am hesitant because I feel like who wouldn't be, you know, like I'm no longer in my, my age of like, if you just say the right thing, I'll blindly follow it. I'm like, Hey, that's so great to hear. And I look forward to seeing if your actions align with what you're telling me, because if your actions don't align with what you're telling me, it doesn't matter. Right. So, you know, he's, he was like, cut the roster, give me a chance. And I was like, Hey, like, that's a really bold statement for someone who I met a week ago. You know, like I just met you and you want me to give you a full investment when like, you don't know my middle name. You don't know my last name. Like you don't know my full identity. You don't like know me super well. And I just, I I don't know, like that's interesting. And he was like, I wasn't looking for anything, but like, I want something with you. And I was like, okay, like, what does that mean though? And so we were just kind of casually going on dates, you know, one to two times a week for the past like three weeks. And this past weekend met for dinner. And at the end of, you know, we got dinner, went for a walk, got ice cream. It was super cute. And, you know, while we were there, we kind of had like a, a deeper conversation and shared a little bit more vulnerabilities. And it's like, every time I've seen this person, like he's very clear with like, Oh, and by the way, I want to see you again. Like, when can I see you next? And I think that's something that like people don't think about as often as they do. And like, if you are a younger woman listening to this, I want you to take this advice to heart that like, if a man wants you, he's going to get you. Like, he's going to see you. He's going to find you and is going to put in the effort to be like, I want to see you, you know, like I've, this isn't the first time that someone's, you know, very openly been like, Hey, I want to see you again. Hey, like what are you doing? You know? And the difference is so blindingly, blaringly obvious of like, oh, of course you mean what you say. When you say, I want to see you again. Okay. See me again. Make, tell me when you're going to see me. This is my schedule. You tell me, okay, go for it. Make it happen. You know, like I was like, Hey, like you're busy. I'm doing my own shit. And it was like, hey, well, while you're doing your own shit, like, can I get a couple hours of your time when you're driving home? Sure. Okay. And don't take that for granted. Like when someone says that they want to see when they follow through on that, like believe that, believe that their actions are aligning with their words. And it it builds the trust that like, okay, you mean what you say. So we did that and, you know, we're saying goodbye, whatever. And, you know, while we were finishing up, he was like, I kind of like mentioned, I was like, I don't have the title, you know, like, I don't know how you want me to act when like, I don't, I don't have a title. So it doesn't tell me how, like, if I had a job title, I would know what the job description is because I would see, Hey, when you apply for a job, it says the job here is girlfriend. The role of girlfriend includes insert roles and responsibilities. Right now, I don't have roles and responsibilities. I'm just kind of here, kind of hanging out. What's going on? Like, that's it. And so I was like, well, (laughs) I don't have a title. So I don't know what you expect from me. And he was like, you're being so spicy today. And I was like, yeah, a little bit, but also like, I'm just being spicy because I'm in a mood, right? Like I'm not being spicy towards you. I'm just like, I'm just a sassy bitch. I'm a sassy person. I know that I am. Get with it or get off the train. Anyways. So I was very open with like, I'm not expecting, like, I know what my timeline is for when I'm like, okay, shit or get off the pot. Like, either give me a title or I'm going to leave. All right. We saw that with Jesus hair. I want you to give me girlfriend treatment. And I said, you're not my boyfriend though. And he said, but like, I want to see that so that I can decide if I want to be your boyfriend. And I said, no, 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 no. Like I'll casually date you and I'll start giving you a little bit of girlfriend treatment as like things progress, but I'm not going full girlfriend until I get the fucking title. Fuck people who don't want to give you the respect of confirmation to you and request the most. Okay. That's no. Do you do jobs for free? Do you dedicate 40 hours a week to grinding your brain, your physical labor, like whatever, and not get a fucking bag? No, no, you don't. So why the fuck would I do that in a relationship? Why would I give you 
my emotional space? Why would I welcome you into my home? Why would I give you my love, care, and attention? Because I have a big heart, you know? Like, I feel things really big. I care really big about people. Why would I give that to someone who's not giving me the fucking respect of, hey, the bare minimum of, like, if I'm giving you pieces of me, I want the sanctity and, like, I want a relationship. That's just who I am. I want to know that if I'm giving you this, that I have the foundation there that like I'm giving it because it's building a relationship, right? Not just like, here's just this guy that I met on the internet that I've been on like three dates with and he wants me to like play with his hair and, and you know, mommy him. No, we're not doing that. We finished dinner, whatever. I was like, I know what the timelines are in my head of when I'd start probing because like that wasn't me probing. That was me just making it known of what my thoughts are you know, me being me. And he was like, okay, like, yeah, he was like, honestly, I think three weeks, I would know if I want to date someone. And I said, well, it's been three weeks. And he was like, has it? And I said, yeah, you don't have to give me an answer right now. You don't have to tell me if that's what you want. Like you've made it clear that like, you like me, you want to continue seeing me, that you want more of me and more investment from me. And I get that. Like, I'm not concerned with like where this is moving, but if you don't respect my time, eventually I'm going to say you didn't respect my time and, you know, to the degree that I would desire and expect. So I'm going to go and we're making out by the car, whatever, because it's butt fuck. And that's what people do in butt fuck. They just like make out next to their cars in parking lots, like classy bitches. And he was like, I want to be with you. Like literally exact words. I want to be with you. And I said, well, you're, you're seeing me on, on this date. And he said, beyond that. I said, well, you're, you're going out of town this weekend. So I won't be able to see you then. You like, you won't be able to like be with me then. But like, when you come back, you can be with me. And he was like, no, no. Like, I want to be with you. And I was like, what does that look like? And, you know, he gives the description that you would expect of like a relationship. And he was like, I don't expect a response from you right now. You know, like, I'll see how you feel Wednesday. And I was like, oh, I want to be with you too. Like, I wouldn't continue investing in you if I didn't want to be with you. Obviously, I also want the same. And I drove away and I was like, and I was like, did we just define the relationship? Is that defining the relationship? Yes or no? Yeah. So I think, I think that's it. Um, I saw him, you know, last night and we kind of talked about it and he was like, yeah, like you're my girl. And I know that like for my clarity, I'm sure next week I'm going to be like, Hey, I want to make sure that like, I have the right understanding of what's going on. Like when you say this, do I introduce you to my friends as my boyfriend? Do you explain, you know, like he was like, I, I may have told my dad about you. It's like, what, in like what way, you know? And it was like, just that like, you know, he asked where my time has been spent. And I said that I met a lady who does this for a living and lives in this area and that I like you and whatever. And I was like, hmm. So just like that. And of course he's a man. So he doesn't give the full story the way a woman would like I want to know location I want to know were you guys sitting down were you standing up was it at the water cooler was it in an office was it at home was it over text I want all the details okay I want a full story and I I understand that like not all men are trained to give a full story like that the way that I like a story to be told okay that's okay we'll work on it work on it okay so I was like oh that feels like a big step and like I don't feel confused. Like those are my big things. Like if he wants you, you'll know. And if he doesn't, you'll feel confused. I don't feel confused. The only thing I feel confused on is like, when you say be with me, you mean you trying to wife me up, bitch. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anyways. Other notes. I self-tanned and that relieved like 3% of my depression. It was great. It was amazing. 
I know that I talked about it on the previous episode, but I genuinely have really struggled with my mental health over the past couple months. And the past month itself was probably my lowest, which on the bright side also means that I'm climbing back up. You know, I'm a big believer that you can't really get better until you hit the rock bottom. So like if you're on the way down being like, hey, when, where do I stop? Because like, is it a rock slide that I'm uncontrollable and like, I know that it's got to get a little bit worse or am I at the point where I'm like, oh, hey, I can dig my heels in and pause on this side of the slope and I can take a deep breath and I can climb back up. And I was at a point where I, I couldn't get my bearings. And so I hit my bottom and I got back up and shout out to one, my girlfriend, Reagan. I know you listen to every episode and I love you so much who reached out to me and checked in when she was like, you said you were taking a one week hiatus and it's been two weeks. What's wrong? What's going on? Are you okay? Are you alive? Like you good? Cause I know you're not. And that was just, I felt like that was the life raft in that moment of one, the amount of love that I felt there. And I'm listening to Dolly Alderton's everything I know about love. And God, do I love my female friends? God, do I love my friends? You know, of like, when you have a good girlfriend, or if you're a guy and you have a guy, friend, if you just have a good friend, okay, a good friend who's able to we don't live near each other. You know, we live in the same state, but we live on the opposite sides of the state and we see each other, you know, once every couple months and we text just about every day, but is able to just pause and feel your energy from afar and go, Hey, I know you're not okay. Something's off and I I need to check in on you. What's going on? Oh my God. Is that love? What love it is to know that people care. And not only do they care, but they notice to be noticed and to be known are such big loves. And, and I so, I fucking appreciate it. So thank you to you. I love you so much. You know, I was like, yeah, I just, I, I'm so exhausted and I can't do it. And I, I've been struggling and I made an appointment to, you know, get help. And I love that you're like, when, when you reach out and you're like, Hey, I'm a new patient and like, I'm struggling. I need help. They're like, yeah, we can get to you in two months great. Amazing. I'll just struggle for two months. Great. Um, I also, I went up and I spent a weekend with our long distance friend, Dana, who was so much fun. And she and I previously lived together. And so getting to have like a slumber party weekend, I always love them. And it's like, I feel like I, God, I wish I could go back and cherish when I lived with my roommates in college and where I'm at in life right now. I'm happy without roommates. You know, I love living on my own. I see myself living with a partner in the future. I don't, I I just can't imagine my life with like a roommate, you know, and, you know, putting an ad out and being like stranger wanted to live in my house. Like, no thanks. But when I was in college and like, you know, that's a very normal thing of like, you're getting paired up with people who have similar interests, whatever. And then you move in with your friends and stuff like that. And, you know, there's, there's a novelty about it that I, I do miss. And I was with her and got like last minute plans for a date. And I was like, oh my God, I've got to get ready and getting ready for a date with your girlfriends. Oh my God. I miss that. It was so much fun. We, I was like, I don't have an outfit. We got to go to the mall. We go to the mall. We're shopping. First of all, the curve love dad jeans from Abercrombie and Fitch. Fuck me up. Okay super cute, super cozy. They're like an appropriate length. I can wear them to work. Like I have always worn hoochie cutter shorts. Okay. Like I look back at it and my parents consistently, like that was just the clothes that I wore. And like, I never thought twice about it. My parents were like crop tops are whorish. You shouldn't wear crop tops, but your butt cheeks can hang out of your shorts. Like I was wearing Daisy Dukes my entire childhood. Can't say the same for my other siblings, but like they were allowed for me because I was thin. Like, okay, that's fucked up, but all right. So finding shorts that are like work appropriate and like age appropriate that I'm like, I don't, I don't want to feel like my coochie lips are hanging out. Okay. Cause I have a pair of jeans that literally my pussy hangs out of. 
it's disturbing. Why are those allowed to be sold? Right? I was like, I can't wear those in public. They also don't fit my ass anymore because we are juicy licious. So it's amazing. Oh my God. I okay, I did talk about this guy because I I'm remembering now. I talked about the dinner date because he told me, well, you're not skinny. Yeah, I'm dating the guy that told me, well, you're not skinny. Fun fact. And I love that because like he's right. Like I'm not as curvy, but like I have curves. Like I have a matured adult woman's body, you know? And I was like, damn, you're right. Um, He's not as wide as I am. And I've given him that note that I'm like, this isn't, this is a first for me that I'm like, I typically have gone after people that like have made me feel like a dainty little princess physically. And not that you don't, but I'm, I'm a bit wider than you are. And he was like, no, I was like, yeah, just a, just a little bit. Okay. My ass is going to have Kimley larger than yours. Okay. No baggie. It's great. That's fine. So that's fun. Okay. Enough about relationships. I have notes because, you know, I tried to keep track while I was in the depths. Um, so late night thoughts, bravery is just overcoming fear. Uh, people that have bravery, I tried to think about it because I was like, what does being brave mean? Being brave means you're not afraid. Being brave means that you do the things that other people are afraid of. No, bravery doesn't mean that you're not afraid. Bravery just means that you are doing things scared. Bravery means I I acknowledge that this is scary, but I'm going to do it anyways. You know, I think about all the times that someone has called me brave and I'm like, but I didn't feel brave. You know, what is the definition of bravery? That's what is the dictionary one? The dictionary says that bravery is courageous behavior or character. But what does courageous mean? And the meaning of courageous is having or characterized by courage. Okay, what does courage mean? Courage. The ability to do something that frightens someone. Bingo. Strength in the face of pain or grief. So to have courage means you are experiencing pain and grief and you are persisting. To be brave means you are experiencing pain, grief, suffering, and fear, and you are continuing on. That you are feeling it and are moving through it. You're not moving past it. You're moving through it. And I, I, it, that never made sense to me. Before. Like, I don't know why that never clicked in my silly little bird brain, but like, of course, right? Of course. You know, I think about all the time, you're so brave. We call other people brave because they do the things that we're afraid of. Am I wrong? I'm not wrong. Anyways, I am right a lot. So I'm also having to accept the fact that I am type A. I love control. And maybe I need to stop fantasizing about relationships where I am not the one who's in control and I'm not the one who's like, here's exactly what I want. And I realize that part of this is I have to vocalize my needs and I have to say like, I want to do this. Because if I don't tell you what I want to do, I'm never going to get to do it because you won't know, right? We're aware. We've been in therapy. We're working on it, right? But like, I think I've I've had this like image of the perfect relationship for me is going to be someone who takes on the role that I've always done of like plans everything that I want to do perfectly and all of the things and is just like takes over. Like I don't have to worry about anything. They are in control, except if somebody else is in control, I'm going to be like, did you do this right? So oh, can I actually, mm, okay, right. So maybe that's not what I want. Maybe that's what I think I want, but that's not what I need, right? Side note, if you don't experience a 28 to 32 day hormone cycle, let me tell you about it. When I look in the mirror, the image that is reflected back to me is crazy different depending on what week it is right? If I'm on my period, that's a fucking ogre bitch who needs to be covered in a paper bag, right? I am in my fertile peak window right now. And I'm like, that skinny, sexy, thick, juicy bitch, right? I'm thin in the right places. I'm juicy in the right places. That is a perfect looking princess, right? Like, look at, look at these chompers. All right. Gorgeous. Who wants to be suffocated, right? Naturally, naturally, Next week, nope, 
can't guarantee I'm going to feel this way. Next week, I'm probably going to be like, mm, 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 mm. And guess what? It's because a week later, I'm going to get my period, right? Right. When I look at myself in the mirror and I'm like, I want to get liposuction. I want to start doing 10 miles of cardio a day. I'm probably getting my period, right? Yeah. So that's a thing. And so getting ready for a date with girlfriends, we already talked about it, but like doing my makeup, going shopping, underrated. If you are in a period of your life where you get to do that shit regularly, take photos, make those moments so memorable because like you're probably not going to remember the date, but God, are you going to reminisce on going into your roommate's room to be like, does this outfit look stupid? And then going through their closet or vice versa, you know, like those types of things. I just, God, I, I would love to invest. I wish I could go back in time and invest more of, of those times into those moments. Cause I was so afraid of everybody else. You know, I was, I was so crippled by this like mental block of like, well, I'm supposed to be isolated. Like I, I don't do that. And so I have some memories of it of like getting ready for date parties with, you know, my girlfriend Delaney. I remember it was one of my favorite ones. It was a formal and we, it was just the two of us. She did my makeup. We did our hair together and we're like trying on dresses and taking photos and just like giggling and talking shit about what was going on. And like, those are the moments of girlhood that like, I just hold so dear to my heart. I really do. And I think they're so special and God having girlfriends is such a gift. It really is. And I'll, I'll, I don't think I'll ever take it for granted. And I'm so lucky about that. Cause I think I did take it for granted as a kid. Like, yeah, you have girlfriends, like, of course, of course. And then you get to a point where like, oh, I'm not surrounded by them anymore. And the relationships change and they become deeper and they become like, there's, there's just an intimacy that you have with your girlfriends that you don't find anywhere else. And I don't know who the quote was. It might be Dolly Alderton. I don't know, but you know, I look maybe, I think it was Jane Fonda actually of like, I learned intimacy and I learned love from my female friendships and God is that so true. My female friendships were the ones who have always been there for me in my lowest lows, my highest highs. And that have celebrated my big wins with me when my family didn't, when my partners didn't. And I know that I've had this rant before and I'm going to have it again, but God, do I love my friends? Do I love my girlfriends? You know, I'm, I'm so blessed and thankful. And if you're in a period of life right now where you're going, I don't have that. And I don't have people invest in it, reach out to the people that you do have in your phone and build a deeper, like it's a two-way street, reach out, do the thing. Even when you want to say no, invest in getting out and doing the things that build relationships with them. Because the older you get, the more valuable they are, you know, um, more quotes that I wrote in the middle of the night. Um, I can't fuck up what's meant for me. And if setting boundaries pushes someone away, they were not meant for me. You know, those setting boundaries will never push away those that want to be in my life. And I, I think about this cause I had a conversation with my dad actually, and you know, he made a comment of like, and then you, you know, with all of your little boundaries and whatever. And I was like, you know, those are in place in order to provide the like rule book of what does this relationship look like so that it's not, you know, overstepping so that it's not crossing any lines that make me feel uncomfortable or make you feel uncomfortable. Like it's to be beneficial. And it was like, well, as a parent, like some of those just don't apply. That's that doesn't apply to parents. I was like, no, you're the one who's supposed to teach that, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Like, I understand that I have a narcissistic parent, you know, that, well, of course, boundaries don't apply to that person. Of course, right? Like, no, I, I'm the parent. Like, that's, that's not how this works. And I, I'm like, that's why we don't have a relationship, right? Besides acquaintances, right? Like we don't, we don't have a parent child relationship. We're just like acquaintances who've spent a lot of time together in the past. And like, you had to take care of me when I was a literal infant and child who could not take care of themselves. But like, you know, I think about people that are like close with their families and I'm like, it's so fascinating to me. 
And I, I love learning from people like that. Cause it, I have a lot of grief about that of like, I would love nothing more than to have the type of relationship where I can call my mom about my boy problems and that I can talk to my dad about what's going on in my life and that I can find a, you know, an opinion that I respect and that I value because I trust in my parents. And that's, that's not the case. Um, you know, I, I'll be very vulnerable with this. About a year ago, I thought that the relationship that I had with my mom was changing. Um, my biological mother passed away when I was five years old in a freak accident. And my dad got remarried when I was nine years old. And the woman he remarried became mom for me. I mean, she's the person who raised me from a very young age. You know, he was with her from the time I was six or seven until I, you know, until now. And when I was a little girl, I feel like she and I were close. And I think about times as a kid that like she betrayed my trust in ways that I feel like at the time, of course, parents make, you know, those mistakes of like, I told her things in confidence as a kid, you know, like I had a crush on a boy and a girl who I thought was a friend to me, you know, also had a crush on him and like made actions towards it. And I was like, whoa, like, but you know that I like it. Like I, I wasn't able to comprehend that. And I'm able to recognize now that like my mom, um, who the woman that raised me, um, you know, she didn't have a lot of female friendships like that. You know, I didn't see her have strong female friendships really besides like the neighbors. And so when I came to her with those types of, you know, friendship issues, it was like, that's why I, I don't have a lot of female friends. Like it's drama and it's, it's catty and whatever. And I realize now the similarities that she and I have of it was fear it was fear of being rejected. It was fear of, you know, not being liked and fear of being seen for who she was and who she is. And I think she was such a wonderful person and and it's a shame that it was lost, but you know, God, I wish I look at her with the eyes of like, I feel like sometimes the parent of the nurturer and seeing like, God, but you, you would have loved it. And God, who wouldn't want to be friends with you? You were so fun and exciting and and happy to be around. And people were lucky to be in your presence. And God, how much joy would it have been to have found people that light your fire the way that you light their fire, you know, and that it's able to amplify who you are. That's how my girlfriends are for me. They amplify all of me. And I feel like it's a mutual thing. Now, Unfortunately, you find friends that are candle blower outers, as Brené Brown talks about, of like, those aren't people you want to be around. People that make you feel small, those aren't your friends. And unfortunately, you have to get experience with those to learn what they are and know the difference. And that's a tough thing to learn. And it either scorns you and it it prevents you from moving forward and developing those strong relationships or, you know, you move on, you find good friendships. But um, a year ago, I thought that my relationship with my mom was going to get to a point that was stronger. And my mom is an alcoholic. And when I was in college, it was probably the roughest years of her addiction. And she was struggling with sobriety and just had a lot going on. And I wasn't there. And when I was there, you know, I was the kid that tried to hide her addiction because, you know, it made life a little easier. I grew up in a household where there was a lot of fighting and, you know, I tried to minimize it as much as I could by doing my part of trying to, you know, protect the people that I thought that I was protecting. And about a year ago, she was sober and we were having semi-regular phone calls and I felt like she was invested in my life. Then one day she called me and told me that when my brother passed away, she would likely kill herself. And that she trusted me to keep an eye out for my younger brother. And I remember asking her, you know, 
with all, he's not dead yet, right? He's still alive. He's not living, but he's breathing. You know, he's not alive, but he's not dead is where we're at currently. And at the time it was rough, you know, it was, it was a fresh accident, but you know, she called me and was like, I'm, I'm going to kill myself when he dies. Cause I'll have nothing left to live for. And this was after a conversation where I was like, you know, I, I always pictured you being there as grandma when I have kids and, you know, going wedding dress shopping with me and, and being that person. And like, I've never not seen you as my mom. And she was like, you know, that means a lot to me, but I never saw myself as your mom. And that hurt, that hurt so big to have someone, you know, look at me and say, for the past 15 years, every time you called me mom, it made me cringe on the inside and thinking, but that's, but I thought that's who you were like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, and having the therapy that I've had of being like, I understand where you're coming from. And I understand the pain that you must've felt of being forced into the role of being a parent to children that weren't yours and, you know, not having the ability to be like, okay, well, they'll go to their moms next week and she'll explain these hard topics. And then suddenly being forced into, Hey, you've got to be the one that teaches them how to be women and being like, well, we didn't talk about this before we got married. And I think that's something that is a fault of the two adults when I was a child, that they didn't have the hard conversations before they decided to blend their families and they didn't decide what it would look like, how to parent a blended family. And so that was a really big base of their issues. You know, they just kind of went with the flow and they didn't have the hard conversations that they needed to have in order to be successful in a marriage that was blending families. Right. But so she, you know, let me know that she never felt like my mom and still doesn't. And that at least now she doesn't feel a full body cringe when I refer to her as mom. Okay. You know, and then a couple months later, you know, called me and said, going to kill myself. I said, okay, but what about your other son? And she said, you've always taken care of him and I, you'll take care of him. And I said, but what about me? She said, you've always taken care of yourself. I said, yeah, but I don't, I don't want to, I mean, I want to take care of myself, but like, I want you to want to be in my life. And, you know, I don't think it really hit me at the time of like, I thought you wanted to be in my life. You know, I spent my whole childhood of like, I chose you girls too. Like I didn't just choose your dad. I, I chose you guys too. And I'm not going anywhere. You know, I remember being in therapy as a kid and having, you know, her sit there and being like, she's me, you know, having my mom tell the therapist of like, I don't understand. Like I can't go to the bathroom without her having a panic attack that I'm missing. She always has to know where I am. And it like, she fucking melts down if she doesn't know where I am. And I remember the therapist being like, yeah, she went to school one day and came home and her mommy was dead. So then someone else came in and she said, I don't trust that you're going to leave the house and come home. I feel afraid when you leave the house, because what if you don't come home? Because that's happened. That happened to her. And it, it got better, you know, the separation anxiety and, and abandonment fears got better, but they were prevalent. And, um, and we didn't talk a lot after that, after that phone call. Um, I think she called me one other time after that. And then I don't know, three, four months ago on a Tuesday at about 4.30 p.m. sent me a text message letting me know that she no longer wishes to be part of my life and that she wishes me nothing but the best, but that she will no longer be in my life. And again, I wish you nothing but the best. 
but I'm done. And I was like, yeah. Part of me was like, there it is. There it is. Hey, go back and tell 10-year-old me whose hands you held and said, I'm not leaving. At the end of the day, like, yes, your father and I fight. Like, I'm not leaving. Go back and tell her you lied. Go back and tell her 10 years from now, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to say I didn't mean that. And, you know, it's funny because I was like, well, we haven't, we haven't really had a relationship in like 10 years, right? You know, about 10 years ago, it started becoming the relationship was only there when I was doing good, when I was doing what was asked. And when I was, you know, being the good show pony who got the National Honor Society and, and won the awards and was nominated for awards and and was doing well in school. And, and then it was, you know, oh, of course, of course, we'll be there. We'll, we'll showcase that. That's important. But when I was depressed and scared and struggling, well, you just needed to get better. And that's not my daughter. You know, when I was 18, she kicked me out of the house for a week and told me that I was my father's problem and I wasn't hers. So I needed to get the fuck out. And I slept at a friend's house for a week. And I snuck in through my bedroom window to get clean clothes because I didn't pack enough clothes and I didn't know how long I was not going to be welcomed in what I thought was my home. And then at the end of that week, I moved to college. And it was like it never happened. There was no apology, you know. So I should have seen it coming. And I, I, I've talked to my therapist about this. And I was like, I was prepared for it. I mean, it's not like we had a relationship. But God, does it still hurt? You know, especially when like, you know, in her sobriety journey, other people keep telling me that I'm one of the biggest apologi- like apologies that she wants to make and just doesn't know how because she has so much to apologize to me for. And I'm like, she does. And if you're listening right now, in my head, you're still, I still see the best versions of the mother that you were. And I still love the amount of love and care that you showed me from when I was eight until I was 11. Because you were really good those years. You were great. You were phenomenal. And those were really formative for me. And those showed me a lot of like things that I think I want to be as a mother. And I understand that the addiction took control, but I don't forgive you for being selfish. I accept your apology, but it doesn't change it because your behavior hasn't changed. And I don't keep people in my life that don't want to be here. And I trust you when you say that you don't want to be here. And that's okay. I'm okay with that. But that's weight on me. And, and that was tough. And I didn't share that with a lot of people, but I'm glad that I'm sharing it now in most public platform fucking possible. Um, Because to my core, I'm still an eight-year-old girl who loves her mom and who wants her mom to love her. You know, who wants, who thinks that it's possible to have the relationship with her mom that her friends had where they'd get sick and their moms would stay home from work and take care of them and make them soup and brush their hair and tell them that they loved them. And not the version of the mom who found the journals where they were keeping track of what they were eating and how much and what their weight was and how many inches their waist and their wrists and their ankles were and threw it at them while they were vomiting because they had no immune system left and said, you did this to your fucking self and walked away. I don't forgive you for that. That wasn't the type of mother that I deserve. But I acknowledge that that was the best that you could do. And I acknowledge that I will never do that. Um, so, yeah. So that was hard. Um, and I, f- I feel like I'm finally at a place of like acceptance. Because at first it was like, you know, I, I talked to a, a buddy about it immediately and was like, yeah, I called it. Like, call me a fucking psychic. Knew this was coming. Knew it would happen. Happens eventually. And he was like, yeah, I think you're, I think you're deflecting because I think you're in a lot of pain. I was like, I, I feel like it shouldn't hurt me because it's not like we had a relationship. It's not like we talked, you know, we just like sent a text here or there, you know, like she sent me a text for Easter, you know, a little emoji of like, it's Easter. 
happy Easter, you know, whatever. But then sitting there and being like, so I don't, I, I probably shouldn't text her happy Mother's Day, right? That's, that's coming up. That'd be weird because the last text message on my phone is about you not wanting a relationship with me. And then it was a follow-up of, you know, photos of messages between my father and his mistress, girlfriend. I don't give a fuck what she is, but at the time, I mean, you're still married, dude. So maybe don't do that. Um, and you know, this is what your father does. And, you know, me setting a boundary of, Hey, this is inappropriate. This is really fucking inappropriate for you to send me, um, as a child of you and him, like that's inappropriate. And also you've stated that you have no desire to be in my life. So like, I respect that, but like, you're not going to send me this shit. And, you know, her being like, funny, that's not how you respond to your father. And I'm like, I don't talk to him. I don't. So yeah, it's tough. It's tough to kind of look in the face and realize, because when there was nothing said, you know, at least the hope was there. Like, you know, maybe one day she'll get sober and maybe one day she'll apologize. And maybe one day I never wanted an apology. I just wanted a mom. I'm going to be 25 this year. And it'll be the 20th anniversary of my biological mother's passing. And I remember telling my therapist, I was like, you know, my sisters had their, had their dads, you know, um, both of my sisters are, are daddy's girls and their dads love them so much. And I think I was supposed to be like my mom's kid, you know, like I, I think naturally kids tend to like drift towards one parent. I, I think I was meant to be my mom's and I think. I didn't get to have that. And then I became a grandparent's girl. And in losing this mom, I was closest with her parents. And, you know, as I moved away and as the relationship with my mom got strained, it also got strained with that. So for the past six years, I've slowly lost the people that I thought that I was valuable to. And that was really tough. It was really fucking tough. Um, and I think the hopelessness of it hit me because like, you know, the anniversary hit of one of the most wild years of my life. And while I was going through it, like, you know, when a bear is chasing you, you just keep running and you're like, yeah, like, of course we're going to sprint, you know, over the past year, my brother got into a car accident. That is the reason for his death. And he hasn't died yet, but he's for all intents and purposes dead. He has no chance of recovery um, and is in a vegetative state and is going to be connected to machines to keep him alive until somebody has the grace to say this is not living and this is more harm than good, right? Uh, and he got better and worse and better and worse. My whole spiel with my mom happened. Um, my grandfather tried to solicit a sexual relationship with me, which was disgusting and horrifying and shocking. Um, cause he was sending me shirtless, laying their photos, asking me to FaceTime him naked so that we could be one together and we could see how much of an impact we've had on each other. And he's still, I don't speak to him. I cut him off immediately, um, and reached out to other family members. Like, is he sending anybody else this? And they were shocked and appalled and were like, what the fuck? And I was like, no, just me. Cool. 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 Hate that. Um, that anniversary has come up and he just popped out of fucking nowhere uh, with a new email address asking for my physical address so he can send me things. And I'm like, no, like, what do you, what do you not get? Um, he then continued to reach out to family members about how I was being dramatic. I was overreacting, whatever. And they were like, no, we read the messages, right? That's weird. Um, and then he defended it by saying that we were spiritually entwined soulmates and that I was afraid of the connection ran right away. And I was like, no, I'm disgusted and appalled. Um, Cause again, I don't know you that well. You're pretty distant. Like just because I was the only one who answered your calls and texts doesn't, doesn't mean anything like that. So that was gross. Um, Yeah. It all kind of came bubbling up and it hit me and I was like, and I'm alone. Um, Have I gone through a couple few month flings? Yeah, of course anybody would. Were they serious? No. Did, was I delusional enough to be like, I'm just, 
I don't want to be alone. Yeah, of course. You know, you feel big things. And I, I, so much growth and maturity has happened in the past year. And I'm so thankful for it. I'm so fucking thankful for it. But like, oh my God, I'm exhausted. And it hit and it hit me all at once. And I needed a couple months to just feel it. Cause I, I, I struggle with feeling the feelings, um, which is not fun and it sucks. And I wish I could feel things better and I'm learning and I'm excited to continue learning that, but God damn, does it suck? So forgiveness is on my list. Forgiveness isn't for the other person. You know, forgiveness is for you. That's what people say. I don't necessarily agree with that. I let go of the anger and disgust that I have. I let go of the pain because it's no longer serving me, right? I don't know that I forgive people for what they've done to me, how they've treated me, but I'm not going to live festering in frustration and pain because of it, right? You don't have to forgive people, but you have to move on. And I'm moving on. And it may have taken me a year to process it and get there, but I'm moving on. I don't forgive you, but I will move on from it. And I won't think about you again. More midnight thoughts. I want to feel important and I crave being important to someone. And I think we all do. And this is a conversation that I've had with a couple different people recently of like, to our core, we're social beings, right? And to our core, we look for companionship, of course. But what is, why do we look for companionship? And I think the bottom line is we want someone who witnesses our experience with us. You know, what is our experience worth if we are not doing it with someone who's able to see us, empathize with us, feel us, and have that mutual connection? Because what are we without the community and the understanding and the knowledge and, and the the safety of having someone who says, I, I'm seeing all of you and I'm seeing you go through this and good, bad, ugly, I want to be there. I want to I want to witness the full range of what your life is and is going to be. And I know that it's going to change and I'm going to change too, but we're going to do it together. That's what we're looking for, you know. It yes, we want love, but we want to be witnessed for the extent of of what we want. We want to be accepted. And we want to have someone who my existence is important to. You know, I look at my family and I'm able to understand that like to the people who my mere existence should have been of utmost importance. It's not. And it never was. It might have been for a short period of time, but for the past several years, it hasn't been. And that speaks volumes. And that's helped me to understand what those relationships look like. Because when I'm important to people, relationships are facilitated and they're cared for. My girlfriends, I I mean, God, my oldest sister, I know she listens to every single fucking episode to keep up with me. Jordan, I love you. You have been such a lifeline over the past several years for me of those are the people that have always, always, always made sure that I knew that I was important to them. And I've, I want to believe that I've done the same. God, I, I hope that I've done the same. And sometimes I worry that I don't have the capability to make people feel important, but also I know that that's not true. I know that I make people feel very important because when someone's important to me, I'm like, I'll move mountains. I'll change my schedule. I'll drive hours. I'll do whatever it takes to, when someone needs me, be there. And God, I, you know, I think we all just want someone that'll do that for us. And I know that I've done it for other people. And I think I've gotten to a point where I'm like, you know, when, when is it my turn? And I know that part of it is I've always been in a circumstance where I can drop everything if I need to. And that I understand that a lot of people don't have that freedom and that flexibility. And I'm so blessed that I do. And that's why I think I've always wanted that in a partner. You know, I want someone who walks in willing and able to do that for me. And that if someone's not willing and able to do that for me, maybe they're not my person and that's okay. But I want someone who's going to move mountains for me. I want someone that's going to protect, provide, and profess their love for me because I want to profess and love and nurture that connection and that person. I would say protect, but who the fuck am I protecting you from? I'll protect your reputation, 
But if it's you, me, and a bear, I hope you have a fucking gun or some some guns. Because uh, I'll just piss myself. <laughs> I'll piss myself and I'll try to pet it. Like, I'm not protecting anybody in, in that situation. So, um, do I have any more notes? Mm-mm-mm. No more notes. Okay. So, we'll pull a card. Guys, I'm sorry that I got so sappy and emotional, but also, like, you're fucking welcome for getting to know me deeper and more personally, okay? Because guess what? We love each other. This is actually, like, such a love relationship, okay? This is called vulnerability. This is called, you want to know why I was gone for almost a month? Because I was fucking processing that shit. And it was depressing as fuck. It is much more difficult to judge oneself than to judge others. That is Antony de saint Exupéry. What can you do tomorrow to become a better version of yourself? I'm going to go to the gym tomorrow because that's that's one of the things that I'm nervous to get back into because I fell out of my routine. And when I fall out of my routines, I kind of get like, oh, fuck it. The whole routine's fucked up and being like, you know what? It's okay for me to not have a perfect routine. It is okay for me to be flexible. I grew up in a family that was like if it's not on the schedule it's not happening and being a kid with ADHD being like I I forgot or this did happen last minute or someone asked me if I can sleep over three nights before the sleepover versus a full week in advance and now I'm an adult who if something isn't planned a full week in advance I'm like well then I guess it's not happening because you didn't plan in time and being like oh no I get to make my schedule I get to be flexible I get to say yeah let's do it Now, do I want someone that respects my time and says things in advance? Yes, absolutely. I would love to know two weeks in advance so I can plan a full outfit and a whole thing and I can make an entire special day of it, right? But I'm allowed to do things last minute. I'm allowed to go out on weeknights. That I'm trying to overcome. It's like, it's a school night. No, it's not a school night. I make my own schedule. I get to do what I want to do. I'm recording at midnight because guess what? I fucking can. And I didn't go to the gym tonight because I felt like not in the mood. I get to do that because I'm in control of my life and it is okay for me to let go of the need to be in control. And I can trust myself to let go. I can trust in the universe and in the people that I am surrounded by to let go and feel safe. That's a mantra that my therapist gave me, by the way. So, okay, friends, I love you so much. Thank you for being here. Um, If you didn't like this episode because it was so squishy and vulnerable, Maybe find someone that is as shallow as a kiddie pool. Because guess what? That ain't me. Um, Tootalooney, thank you for joining us. Toots is in the studio. Come on up. Say hello to the people before we leave. You want to say goodnight? Come on. All right. Tootie says goodnight. Ready? Tootie says, thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. We love everybody who listens. Thank you so much. Keep listening. Share with a friend. Okay? Um. I think I'm slowly getting the confidence to start posting about this on my personal socials. If you bite me, I swear to God, boy. Um, yeah. So maybe one of these days I'll put it on the personals because I'm getting courage, right? It, what is my vulnerability worth if I don't actually attach it to me and go, Hey guys, I'm very fucking vulnerable in this setting and I'm not afraid for people to see it unless you work with me. If you work with me and you're listening to this, get off. No, stop. Don't ever listen to another episode. Don't listen any further. Don't listen any more. No, you're done. You're done. You're done. You're done. Okay. Um, I love you so much. Follow us, Instagram, TikTok, email me, long D friends pod. Hugs and kisses, my friends. Thank you for being patient and loving me. Bye. I love you so much. (laughs) 